G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. There is no trade update today because there is stuff all happening in the trade period. I was hoping for the ability to do trade updates for you every day. Hopefully the stories were going to be evenly spread. As such, nothing really happened today. So hopefully I'll be back tomorrow with some trade news and discussion. However, I'm going to take this opportunity to discuss the concept of premiership windows. I think it's fair to say that trade periods in particular can give a real good indication of where a club thinks it's at in the premiership cycle. So obviously a team you know, trading for draft picks and trying to maximize their draft hand, in most cases is probably thinking of a more long-term build with their list. Conversely, teams that are trading, you know, premium draft picks to get established players for the here and now are obviously indicating that they think they are ready to take the next step. So there's Collingwood and Carlton. Sometimes it's obvious. In other cases, it's a little less obvious. Um, you know, for instance, Adelaide's recruited three established players and they finished bottom four. So where exactly do they think they are? So in today's video, we're going to use a tier maker to map out where we think every team is in the premiership window. Now, I do want to make it clear as well. I think it's important to establish that premiership windows don't necessarily reflect whether I think they're likely to win the premiership or at least contend, I think it's got to be taken into account multiple factors. Like I said, their trade and draft activity, what are they doing in terms of building their list? I think you also got to factor in the age of a relative list as well. So for instance, you know, Adelaide might feel like they're approaching the premiership window, but I've banged on about this recently. They're actually one of the youngest teams in the competition by selected team last year. So is it fair to put them in the premiership window? Then you factor in their recruits and uh, it's a little bit murky. So what we're gonna to do today is try and map it out. By the way, we just hit 31 and a half thousand subscribers. Thank you so much to everyone who's joined recently. It's been a big period of growth for the channel. I would love to get to 32,000 by the draft. So if there's anyone who's enjoying footy content in general or trade and draft content and wants to see more from True Footy, make sure you are subscribed. I would appreciate it. All right, so we're back on tier maker. So I'll explain each section. So obviously in the top tier, you've got it's here. You're in the premiership window. Now, again, there may be teams who fall into this category, but I don't necessarily think they're going to win a premiership or even make the top four. It's more about mindset, I suppose, of the, of the team, of the club. And so I think you're going to find there's a lot of categories in here then, and it's probably going to include some teams you don't think are realistic premiership contenders but I still think it's more about their intent. So on the second one down, you've got on the run up. So teams that probably know that this isn't necessarily the year they're gonna make it to the final four in September, but they're making some list adjustments and moves to try and make that happen soon, to position themselves for an assault in the next couple of years. Then I've got a category here for real fence sitters, teams that I'm personally not sure about. And I wanna talk about, I think I've got three teams in mind that fit into this category where I personally just am not really sure what their intention is. And it's not necessarily a criticism. I just want to talk about them individually. On the way up, this is somewhere between rebuilding. I think rebuilding is self-explanatory. We've probably got three teams that come to mind that firmly sit in this category. There's no realistic hope of them winning the flag anytime soon. And finals, you know, for each of these teams individually probably seems like a little way off. So um, we'll get into that as well. But on the way up, probably includes teams that, um, you know, have more or less finished drafting at least heavily. But further to that, we'd probably need to see some growth in terms of the ladder position to really move out of the rebuilding category. Well, we'll get into all of it in particular. So where do we start? I think let's just start with the teams that we know are in the premiership window. So I think you firmly put, firmly, the Brisbane Lions in here. I mean, how can you say they're not in the premiership window? Um, they're not rebuilding, even though they'll probably get pick one. But uh, I suppose, you know, you could have a category for teams falling away. I don't think Brisbane would be one of those teams anyway. But I think, you know, they're, they're well poised to just prolong this period. And with the Ashcroft brothers and Jasper Fletcher and Sam Marshall and all these talents, like they're, they're set up for a long time. So I think we can all agree the Brisbane Lions are in the premiership window, which is a massive shock, I'm sure. So are the Sydney Swans who uh, were runners up. Age and experience spread of that team is really solid. Um, you know, they've got young guns playing well. They've got good established senior players. There's no real talk of them needing to hit the draft. I mean, some of their best players are still young. Warner and Goulden. I don't think I need to sell you on the fact that the team that finished runners up is in the premiership window, right? And I'm just saying, I don't think they're going anywhere. I'm also gonna put Collingwood in here. So this is why I would ex um, explain the important like nuance to this conversation. So I know they missed finals this year, but again, we're talking about intent and mindset of a football club. I think it was just a bad year for Collingwood where a few things went wrong and they took too long to lift themselves off the canvas and fell away again. But if like they're the oldest team in the competition, they've just recruited Harry Perryman, they're potentially going Tomlinson, Hayes, these guys aren't young, they're top up depth stocks who could play footy of course. Um, Dan Houston, who knows if he'll get there at this current point in time of recording, but I think they're showing every sign of being in the premiership window, they're foregoing the future 
to bring in established talent now. So regardless of where you think Collingwood will finish next year, this is a team that believes it's in the window. Now, if they fall miserably short, they need to be measured against that expectation. But for me, I don't think you can say any other category for a team like Collingwood, regardless of whether you think they are a serious contender next year. Who else are premiership contenders? I'm gonna say Port Adelaide here too. So this one has created a bit of discussion, I think in recent times. and. Um, yeah, I, I keep referencing Kane Corns. I, I suppose it's just easy to reference Kane Corns because he's got such strong opinions. Um, this is not a shot at him. However, I do consider his opinion on this as a Port Adelaide man. And he sort of concluded after the final series that Port Adelaide don't have a good enough list to be in serious premiership contention. Well, I, I just think that's probably a little bit revisionist because I don't know how you can heap pressure and criticism on Port Adelaide up until the point of getting eliminated and then ultimately conclude, well, they weren't good enough anyway, they overachieved. This is not my read on Port Adelaide. This is a team that is topping up for the here and now. They're going for established players, haven't taken a first round draft pick since Josh Sin, if I'm not mistaken. Traded for Jason Horn Francis. I suppose you could say he's a youngster, but certainly a player helping their premiership assault now and in the immediate future. Generally speaking, I think they're set up for a long period of contention when you consider how young Horn Francis, Rosie, and Butters are, which is a little bit beside the point, but I'm just saying that I think their window's open now. I mean, how many times have they made prelims? They specifically traded for established talent in a Sava Radagalia in particular last year. Lukosius is probably going to find his way to Port Adelaide this year. This is the sign of a team that is trying to win a premiership now. So I can't be talked out of that one. Port Adelaide, I, I don't think they're on the run-up. And I suppose that will make more sense when we start populating this one. Geelong are in the premiership window as well. P trust me, trust me, there are some teams that are not. But I think it's kind of eye-opening when you see how many teams actually consider themselves in the premiership window. And so many seasons, we've probably had a look at the, you know, in recent times, you've probably gone, there's probably five or six teams that can win it. I was certainly saying that at the start of 2024. And, um, you know, whatever way you slice it, Geelong are in the premiership window. You know, I, th I thought maybe they did overachieve this year. Um, what does that really mean? Well, I, I suppose deep in the season, I still didn't think of them as being a chance to win the premiership. And then they went into fifth gear and improved massively. Uh, you know, the back end of the year, plus their first final was outstanding and, you know, were beaten by a very good Brisbane side. So uh, whatever way you slice it, particularly with Bailey Smith coming in, while that is kind of a medium term thing as well, in the short term, it only makes them stronger. So Geelong is seriously in the premiership window, whether you like it or not. Is there any other team here? Yeah, I'm going to say GWS. Um, made a prelim last year, for top four this year out in straight sets. They're certainly in the premiership window, right? Like, is there much doubt about that? Their list management, in terms of indicating their, like where they're at as a club, is a little bit harder to read. I feel like right now it's just about staunching the bleeding of players leaving. But, um, you know, if they're linked to Jake Stringer, they're linked to Dylan Schill, there's obviously uh, a vision on trying to win games this year and potentially win the flag. So I think that might be our six teams. And if anyone else comes to mind, I will continue to populate it. Although Carlton, where did Carlton sit into this? See, this is, might be another example, like Collingwood, of a team that is in the premiership window, but probably just fell short last year. They finished eighth with a disappointing season, made a prelim the year before, um, midway through the year looked good. But I, I guess when you consider like where, like the, a lot of the talent that's on that list, their best, best talent are in their prime. You look at their list management decisions and trying to go for Dan Houston. This is a team that's trying to compete for a premiership this year. I think they're in the window too. And again, I wanna make it very clear, this is not the same thing as saying, I think they'll make the top four and I think they're a good chance to win the flag. I'm just saying this is where the headspace is of that cu uh, football club at the moment. I think they're in the window. And I think that's it. I think that will do for now for our premiership contenders. So let's populate the rebuilding. Yeah, <laughs> West Coast. Uh, yeah, so West Coast, you know, I, I'm probably going to put North in here as well. They're probably going to hate that and Richmond. So let's talk about this group of three teams. Three teams that still qualify as rebuilding for me, but probably all, you know, distinctly different stages, right? So Richmond's just hitting theirs now. The last couple of years, particularly this year, um, you know, it didn't go well. But the last couple of years, um, sort of languishing a little bit there, had no first round draft picks, no access to talent. This is the year they're going to cash in by trading a lot of these players. Now, I have my concerns about that, but I'll reserve that until after the trade period, see what they get done, see if they sign anyone. But either way, it's just starting. West Coast are a little further along than that. I think they've been aware of where they're at as a footy club for three years now. And the reality is it's just taking a little while to 
undo some of the damage that was done. Well, God knows what happened to West Coast in 21, like midpoint of that year, everything fell apart. But either way, they've had a few attempts at drafts, but still obviously not as advanced as a North Melbourne. Now, North Melbourne are further along, certainly in the talent accumulation phase, right? They've certainly got the most top five picks of that group, the top end talent, that, that's all sweet. But are they on the way up? Well, probably not. I think they're probably a year off being moved up into this category. You probably need to see them win more than three games for a start. And while this is more about mindset, more so than actual performance. I realize that, but they are still distantly the youngest team in the competition. So for me, uh, you could you could move them up, but I, you know, for instance, are they anywhere near Adelaide level? This is where I put Adelaide, okay? Adelaide, again, you could say, well, actually, no, I'm, I'm going to rule them out of on the run-up. I think on the run-up, you need to have had some degree of proven success and you're trying to top up. You know, Adelaide haven't played finals with this group. The last final Adelaide played in was the 2017 Grand Final. It's been a, it's been a tough road since, and I admire what they've done, and I think their moves this offseason are really good. Now, you could say they're top-up moves. You could say they're top-up moves. Neil Bullen... Pete Ling, Isaac Cumming, I think they're great additions, all right in that mature age bracket. But whatever you slice it, Adelaide were one of the youngest teams in the competition. I think bottom three, by the actual selected games, so not the list average, the selected teams. And sure, they're trying to bridge that gap by bringing in mature players, but I, I would put them in the on the way up category and just a little bit further along than North Melbourne. I think we need to see North Melbourne make some strides before I elevate them, whilst acknowledging, obviously, their talent is a lot further along than a West Coast and even more further along than Richmond. Okay, who have we got left? Who's a team that's on the run-up? Probably the Western Bulldogs in my mind. I don't think they're quite, quite there in terms of premiership window. And I, I suppose this is another one that can be debated. I've heard, again, Kane Corns. I actually just watch a lot of Kane Corns, so that's why it comes to mind. But I think he talks about, you know, top two list and it should be should be right in the window right now. Whereas I think if you analyze it, uh, some of their best talents outside of the the older, elder statesmen, like Trelaw had a great season, Bontempelli, absolute star of the comp, but Jamara, Sam Darcy, um, a lot of these guys are just still still younger than their prime, right? So to me, it doesn't really scream premiership window. I think they're in the retooling phase. Like they're good enough to play finals without necessarily having quite the cattle to make it all the way there. I could be wrong. I mean, they've gotten close in 21, but they are losing Batty Smith. And I do think they're probably looking at like two years from now, which qualifies them for on the run up. By contrast, Adelaide probably thinking firmly entrenched in finals in two years. If they're at the Bulldogs level in two years, that's a pretty good result. The Bulldogs, they probably want to be in that top group within two years. Let's talk about Fremantle now. I'm going to say on the run up again. Now, again, a team that missed finals, I, I understand that, but you know, a long period of hitting the draft and, and building up their talents and topping up and then losing players. And I think they're starting to hit that maturation point. And you can see in the mindset this off season, okay, they do want to keep a presence in this year's draft, but that is also true of everyone. So that's a worthy caveat of, of Carlton, right? They want to keep a pick in this year's draft, but there's some extenu extenuating circumstances. This draft is extremely strong. Carlton have also missed a few drafts, as have Fremantle. So that's why they're a little bit different there. I don't think they're clearly in the window right now, but I think it's, I think two years from now, they're just there with the Bulldogs thinking, okay, we don't need to win it this year, but in two years, we need to be close. And that's why they're going for Shea Bolton. That's why they had a bit of a dip at Liam Baker. Cozzy Pickett, there was some interest there. I don't know exactly to what extent, but Chad Warner in 12 months. This is a mindset of a team trying to win a flag over the next three or four years potentially, or at least get close. But I certainly wouldn't say they're in the window right now, but I do think they probably should make finals next season. Who else we got here? Gold Coast Suns probably also fall into this on the way up category. Now, again, you could say that similar to Adelaide, they're really targeting established players. Uh, I suppose North are probably still keeping an eye on the draft. They want to look at some talls and Adelaide are holding on to pick four, but Gold Coast are thinking, all right, we've, we've got enough academy players. We don't need to take a normal draft pick ever again. We can trade pick six for Daniel Rioli or whoever, however that's going to play out. John Noble. That coupled with the fact that both of those teams on the way up, uh, second and third youngest team by so like I, I, can, I'm, I can hear myself repeating myself, but it's an interesting stat and very, very relevant to this. Gold Coast's best players are still very young. Flanders, Raul, Anderson, Ben King, Mac Andrew, anyone else you want to name, they're still pre-prime and therefore the expectation can't be for them to be looking at two years from now. Maybe that's what internally Hardwick is saying, you know, shoot for the moon, end up in the stars, whatever. Like that's not quite what I'm saying, but I think externally looking at it. They're on the way up. They've done hitting the draft. The draft is going to come to them in Gold Coast case. It is time to top up, but I don't think they're on the run up just yet. I think they're one below that. Hawthorne might be 
the trickiest customer in this entire thing because they overachieved by age and experience expectations. And to be honest, it's been very interesting to see how quickly they exploded as a team without a lot of their high draft picks from finishing low contributing that much. Like it's been a very well-rounded and cohesive effort from the Hawthorne Football Club. But I think considering their age and where they're at, I don't know if I put them right in the premiership window just yet. Now they do get Tom Barris, presumably. They do get Josh Battle, but I think you lower the expectation on Hawthorne are still thinking maybe two years from now. I'm going to put them on the run up. Okay, and, and I suppose the difference here is expectations. So if Brisbane, Sydney, Collingwood, Port, Geelong, GWS, Carlton stuff up season 2024 and don't even get close to winning the flag, let's say they finish eighth, that is, that's going to be marked harshly internally as saying, well, we were there, we were trying to win the premiership, we didn't even really get that close. Well, what would you say about Hawthorne? They finished seventh, they won a final, probably the most entertaining team this season, certainly the biggest story. A little bit like Collingwood in 22, although they didn't quite get as far as Collingwood. Much younger though. I think Hawthorne, if they stagnate and miss finals or stay in the same position, you know, I think the expectation on them will still be pretty light considering how young they are. Probably going to be a little bit more hunted next season. I'm not saying I'm predicting them to stagnate. I'm just saying if they stagnate, I don't think there's a, the level of scrutiny on them. Well, I don't think that scrutiny should come to the same extent as the teams above them. And the list position means there's still a long window ahead. So I'm going to say they're still on the run up. And if they jag a flag, which is possible, if one of those teams, the Bulldogs, Fremantle and Hawthorne jag a flag, I think they've probably probably exceeded what their list position kind of forecasts, if that makes sense. So we've got three teams left. And I'm going to slot them all into which way will it go. And let me explain on all of these. This is actually not a criticism. I just think I just think I want to separate these teams um, into their own category and discuss them individually. So St. Kilda. I do like a lot about what's happening at St. Kilda. I really rate the quality of talent they've brought in. Maybe... Maybe they still lack like a Will Ashcroft level of, of midfield talent. But, you know, Wanganeen Miller, Philippou, Darcy Wilson, Wind Hager, Machito Owens. Like, there's still that's, that's such a good, rock-solid group of talent there for St. Kilda. Where are they at as a list, though? It's, it's unclear for me where they see where they're at. And that's why I'm just going to put, put them in which way will it go. Because you could say they're on the run-up because they finished sixth, right? In 2023, that is. They finished sixth. And, you know, had this great group of young talents and then bottled this year to some extent, came good at the end, but missed finals by a long shot. I think they finished sixth last. They're going to have two top 10 draft picks this year. They lose Josh Battle. Um, at the same time, they recruit or have more or less recruited Jack McRae. That, that might not happen, but that was reported on as he's requested a trade to St. Kilda. So we can at least suggest there's some intent there by St. Kilda to get him. For me, like I, am, I like what they're doing and I, th I think they could easily play finals next year. I'm just not too sure what stage they see their list build is at. Is it, is it about this under 23 group? Because if it is, are they really on the run up or are they on the way up? But I think on the way up is probably selling them short for a team that played finals and had a home final in 2023. This is why I'm unsure about the Saints. I'm not concerned about where they're at. It's a great draft to hold seven and eight in, but it's not really the movements of a team topping up but then they might have Jack McRae as well. So I'm a little bit unsure. Saints fans, let me know. Melbourne is another interesting one. Melbourne kind of made me laugh this trade period. This like, this whole Clayton Oliver thing in particular. I don't know how many people here watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but there's a scene where Andy Samberg is sitting in a hot tub and he's like, I'm not peeing in the hot tub. Are you? I'm not. Are you? And that's what I think of with Melbourne and Clayton Oliver. It's like, there is absolutely no way we, we want to entertain a trade for Clayton Oliver. Unless you do. So many mixed bag stories here. Um, look, Melbourne, I think by most metrics, are a team that's in the window, considering the age profile, who their best players are, how old those players are, and some of the best talent in the country still, Max Gorn, Petrarca, and what we know Clayton Oliver can be. On the one hand, are they trying to, or at least very open to the possibility of, of Oliver leaving? I, I don't know. I don't know. Like I hear a new story about Clayton Oliver every day. I'm inclined to think, you know, that they don't necessarily think they're going hard at a rebuild and want to jettison Clayton Oliver, but I, I do suspect perhaps that they might feel it might be best for them if they trade him for a pick. Now they don't want to trade him for a pittance because that would look bad, but they want to trade him for a pick. But it's very hard to communicate that you want to trade a player for a pick and get a good one because of his behavioral issues. So I just think they've worked themselves into a corner there. I suppose, you know, earlier this trade period, I said that Melbourne... Um, we're a bit of a crossroads. Does Petrarca leave? Does Oliver leave? Does Pickett leave? Now, they're probably going to keep all three as it stands. So th does that put them back in the premiership window? 
in the background, they've been hitting the draft really hard. They've taken, you know, 6 and 11 last year by aggressively trading for those picks. They have pick five this year, apparently aggressively trading into the first round this year. I like that. I'm not against that at all. Although there's probably been one or two deals, particularly with Gold Coast last year, that I don't think worked out. Either way, I'm not too sure where they see their list. I think you could make an argument they're in the it's here category, but they're also making plans for the future there. And finally, Essendon. Again, this one's a tough one. I, I If I had to guess what Essendon's mindset is, particularly that of Brad Scott, it's about building a strong team that plays finals and then probably working out what happens next after that. They want to be consistently in finals, and that was kind of a hallmark of Brad Scott's North Melbourne as well. But they lacked the top talent to really go all the way. I'm not saying they didn't have top talent, but they didn't really you know, have top four finishes. But if Brad Scott's trying to keep it on the short, short term and build a squad that can play finals consistently, that's all well and good. They've recruited four established players last year and have been inactive this year, which I'm not critical of, by the way. I think one thing people are missing about Essendon here is they're getting two first round draft picks. They're going to hold pick nine and, and get Isaac Carco in a strong draft that everyone's trying to get into. I think Essendon's sitting pretty. They're not too concerned about that, but I'm not too sure where they see their list. Like what will this look like in 12 months if Essendon miss finals again? Is it rip it all apart and tear it to shreds and hit the draft? I don't think they're in the premiership window. Are they on the run up? That's probably the next part I would say. I don't know if they qualify for on the up. I think they're a bit more advanced. The, the team's quite mature and it's got a lot of these talents who could go either way. Like we've been waiting a little bit for Perkins. Again, still early for him. Jai Caldwell took a real step this year. Nick Cox. I think Nick, Nate Caddy as a, as a youngster is really good. Don't know about Hobbs and Sardis yet. I think that's where the group, the growth is going to come from this group. And I just find it really hard to see where Essendon sees they're at in the window. So again, all of these teams you can make a case are in different groups. I realize that I'm sitting on the fence with them, but I wanted to discuss them with you and probably get your insight as well as to where you think each of these groups are. But that will do for today, guys. I thought that was a fun exercise. Um, maybe we'll do this again in 12 months time and see how much change there is. It'll be interesting to see because sometimes there's a shocking season positively or negatively that just completely throws out plans like where would Hawthorne have thought they would be this time last year anyway guys thank you for watching let me know in the comments what you think and I'll see you in the next one cheers